good evening viewers this is your host and moderator kulomanandi from global education and training institute welcoming you all in this very special panel discussion of the session and the movement of hashtag destructive education dr sunita gandhi founder of global education and training institute has initiated a nationwide online campaign catered to students teachers trainers principals directors and founders on how to make online learning easier and continue delivering world class pedagogy amidst these difficult times she believes that education is the cornerstone of a nation's development and that shouldn't be compromised at any cost so under her leadership and guidance global education and training institute keti has initiated hashtag disruptive education movement with the sole vision to bring the global uh, the best global educational leaders under one platform chartering the next quantum leap in education for world beneficiaries so today we have wonderful speakers across the globe they are very expert in their own areas experienced highly resourceful and very dynamic so uh, uh, let me remind you all the topic of the session is 21st century skill in early childhood education so let me introduce the speakers one by one and welcome them so first i would like to introduce archana dange she is the director of helena grady international free school coimbatore in tamil nadu india archana has the experience of nearly 3 decades in the field of education of which the last 14 years spent specially with free school education she is a sherry blair alumni and an author with oxford university press for kindergarten and primary textbooks she believes in using creative methods in education through storytelling music and theater she firmly believes in the holistic nature of education that involves more outdoor and hands on training for the child she works with many schools across the country to develop creative modules in primary education her team under the mentorship under her mentorship has developed education materials in print workbooks films slide shows street plays stories and song besides encouraging the use of local traditional media i warmly welcome you archana in this forum and this movement of hashtag disruptive education thank you for joining us thank you so much puloma it indeed is a pleasure thanks to getty for giving us this platform to be able to discuss uh, most relevant topics that we are going to be doing today thank you you're most welcome now let me move to the next speaker she is arpita mithal uh, ceo helena grady international india and south asia and she is from mumbai maharashtra india arpita has more than 30 years of experience in education first as an english lecturer in colleges followed by teaching and developing language courses in the swedish embassy and other consulate office new delhi she has worked with the uh, character voices international walt disney india and with the shepperton studios uk on paramount projects she was instrumental in getting the helena grady speech and drama international an australian franchise to india and has worked as its ceo india middle east and south asia for the last 15 years helena grady international is spread over 40 countries globally and is present in 70 cities across india with 50000 students enrolled launching the helena grady preschools early childhood and care education course corporate and commercial educational theater and other uh, the other feathers in her cap it's brilliant you're most welcome arpita and it's a delight to have you with us today in this panel as one of the speakers and uh, thank you for joining us in this movement of hashtag disruptive education thank you puloma such a pleasure to be here amongst the eminent speakers um i remember i had met dr sunita gandhi almost 10 years back in one of the seminars when seminars used to happen on the in the physical space 
um, and yeah. not like the webinars that happen now. Um, and she had just returned from US with dreams in her eyes uh, for introducing a lot of innovative education. And uh, I found a soulmate, how to get innovative systems uh, built into, integrated into our systems, education systems. Uh, and I'm so glad that we are here discussing that today with the other panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you, Arpita. And uh, uh, did we have Karen joining us here? Is she joined? Uh, she has joined Karen. I'm not able to see Karen, actually. Uh, um, Karen has... Yeah, yeah. Yes. There, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, Karen. <laughs> Hello. So fortunately, you are back again with all these technical glitches. So let me introduce Karen Dickinson, founder and director of Music for Little People, uh, Start Code upon Avon, Warwickshire, UK. Karen is an MA in music education from London University, a BA honors, and a licentiate of Trinity College London. She is the fellow of the Incorporated Society of Musicians and is the founder and director of Music for Little People, a program that has provided preschool music education classes for independent parents and child groups in the community for preschools and nurseries and for UK government schemes for disadvantaged children. The program was introduced in India in 2013, where she was advised the Helena Grady group on the introduction of music into the curriculum and has run workshops for children and teachers across the whole of India. She believes that music can help children learn as all learning happens in a sensory motor way and children learn through doing. Absolutely fantastic, Karen. And I'm so delighted to welcome you in this forum of the movement of hashtag disruptive education. Thank you for being a part and joining all the way from UK. Thank you. It's my great pleasure to be here, making more Indian friends, I hope. Um, and um, with such eminent speakers, I shall be listening with interest to what everybody has to say. Thank you, Karen. Thank you for your wonderful words. Now, let me move to the next speaker. She is Akila Vedyanathan, the founder, director, the Amis Charitable Trust, Coimbatore, Tamil Nadu, India. Akila has contributed for more than 20 years in the areas of disability management and education. She is the founder and director of the Amis Charitable Trust based out of Coimbatore, which provides skill training to persons with autism and related disabilities. She is also a founding member of the Autism Society of India, which is an NGO working in the area of awareness and advocacy. She is a thought leader and is an advisor for Helena Grady Preschools and has significantly contributed to the design and implementation of their unique offering SMILE, that is the sensory motor integration in the learning environment. Akila, it's a pleasure to welcome you here with us and being a part of this panel discussion as one of the eminent speakers. You're most welcome and thank you for joining us in this hashtag disruptive education movement. Thank you, Puloma, and thank you, Getty, for this opportunity. And I'm really looking forward for an interesting discussion with the, all the eminent panelists here on this topic of the skills required in the 21st century for the young ones, the early childhood education. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Akila. And now, finally, moving to our uh, speaker, the last speaker of this panel uh, is Duncan. Uh, Duncan Rice is a director of Helena Grady Drama Academy, Africa, Durban, South Africa. Uh, Duncan has had a lifelong career in the performance, arts, and education, having worked in the UK, Ireland, India, and throughout Africa as an actor and director of many innovative children's stage productions. He was at the forefront of writing school drama curriculum in Cambridge, UK, prior to joining the Helena Grady Drama Academy 20 years back. Most recently, he spent two years in India developing curriculum for the Helena Grady Drama Academy in India and set up a nationwide school Shakespeare competition called the Shakespeare Slam. 
He is now back in Durban, South Africa, as director of the African Network of Helenograde Traumas. Duncan, we are so happy in such a delight and honor to have you amongst us and as one of the speakers of this panel. And thank you for joining us and being a part of it all the way from South Africa. Thank you very much, Puluma. And um, thank you, Getty, for inviting me to be on this amazing panel of people. I feel humbled to be with such incredible people. I, um, as you probably read, I'm an actor and, um, uh, and a director of mainly children's productions, and, uh, but I've worked as well in education. So this is a passion for me what we're talking about today, and particularly education of little ones. So I think it's going to be a, an amazing discussion, and I think we're all going to learn a lot from today. So thank you very much, and I look forward to hearing what people have got to say. Thank you and so much. I thank you so much. Well, I, Puluma and I, I used to live in Kolkata in West Bengal, so I think <laughs> we were really on there, so we share. We share. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, beautiful city yeah. called Kathmandu. Um, can I just say I had the most amazing two years in India, um, such wonderful people and um, really people who are interested in the arts and education, sure, creative sure. arts. Yeah. Thank you so much uh, for appreciating Kolkata, my city of joy. Thank you. Uh, so getting back to the viewers, uh, my dear viewers, you know, in this globally and digitally interconnected world, all learners from cradle to career need new skills and knowledge to succeed. If we want to prepare our children for success in school, work and life, opportunities to learn 21st century skills are essential. The framework for 21st century learning skills focuses on the seven C's. Those C's include critical thinking, creativity and innovations, cross-cultural understanding, communication, computing technology, and career learning. They not only provide a framework for successful learning in the classroom, but ensure students can thrive in a world where change is constant and learning never stops. And they are also tremendously important for our nation's well-being. The 21st century is not in the distant future. It is today. We do not have a moment to lose in preparing our students and our nation to compete and to succeed. So we have to ensure that all of our learners are empowered to succeed with the skills for today right from their foundation age. So keeping this in mind, let us begin this panel discussion. And I request the viewers to post questions in the comment section for our question answers. Round. Well, my first question goes to uh, Duncan. Uh, can I have Duncan in the screen, in the setup? Yeah. Hi. Hi, Duncan. Duncan, I would like to know from you that what you think are the 21st century skills and uh, why do you think that it's even so important, you know, to start from the pre-primary school kids? If you can. Okay, so, yeah. Yeah, I will elaborate on that. So, for me, um, very recently, the World Economic Forum did an extensive study throughout the world of businesses. This was in 2016, so not too long ago. And they were looking to see what skills that businesses needed um, at the end of the day um, with, with business. And very interestingly, it wasn't the skills that we all think. Um, and around the world, of course, parents are very uh, pushy with many of their children, and they want their children to obviously succeed in science and maths. And particularly, I noticed when I was in India that the parents there are really, really keen that children follow science or maths or become engineers or doctors or lawyers. I think those are the three main <laughs> professions. But in fact, what businesses are, are needing, and this was found, yes, we need um, obviously the academic side of qualifications eventually, but the most important things that was lacking in businesses today was four main skills. And the first one 
was communication skills. So as you know, um, I work for the Helen O'Grady Drama Academy, which is an international drama school. Um, and our main focus comes in teaching children communication skills. So this was the very, very first skill. And if we relate that to the early learning situation, children in that area will really, really need from the very start to be taught um, good communication. That's the foundation. It's the very first thing you wait for your children, apart from breathing, the very first thing you wait for your children to do is to speak. So we are very much focused on giving children good communication skills and giving them the tools to be articulate mm -hmm. and to speak well. So the second um, skill that they identified, which was really important, was creative thinking. Now, in our world today, unfortunately, um, many of our schools focus purely on the academic side with children. So again, um, and I'm not, I'm not just saying India, but India is a very good example of this. Um, there is such competition at the end of the day for the, for the public exams that unfortunately, uh, children are almost taught by rote. So children are not taught to, taught to think creatively. So we're trying to help children. Um, that learning by rote is a very left brain kind of activity. So we're trying to get children to use the right brain, the creative side of the brain. Um, so whether that is purely demarcated is another story, but the fact of the matter is we're not teaching these days children to think creatively. And the World Economic Forum said for business, that's one of the most important things. Then the next thing that the World Economic Forum said, which is very, very important, was collaboration. So collaboration, um, again, applied to our early learning situation is so, so important for young children. Children at that age are in the development age are thinking in a very egotistical way. So it's all about me, me, me. Um, those of you who have parents will know that the children are going through that very ego kind of brain. So we're starting to now help children to understand that they're actually living in a world which they've got to work together. And for business, relating it to business, collaboration is one of the skills to really make business really work. Those companies who do exceptionally well, like the Googles and the Facebooks, etc., in their head office, it's all about communication. So the structures they have in their business is not the old hierarchical system of management, but it's about a communication, and building on communication and to using that communication to take business forward. And then the final aspects of the World Economic Forum study was we need to become critical thinkers. Now, again, with our education systems today and all about this exam process, we really, really have to hold no hierarchical system of management. Someone's coming in there. <laughs> we really, really have to help our children to become critical thinkers. So in other words, when we are dealing in the early learning situation, how do we get the children to start to ask questions and feel they want to ask questions? And even parents at home, you must be encouraging your children to talk to you, ask questions. And not just ask questions for sake, but take the question to the next stage. That's what critical thinking is about. So this is very, very exciting. <laughs> we really, really have to help our children. And we can teach them through the creative arts. Okay. So maybe you want to say a little bit more on that subject. So, Duncan, uh, taking this forward uh, with... Puloma? Yeah, can yeah, I, I'm here. I'm I, here. Can I take this forward? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah Arpita. Yeah. I think you're the right yeah. person who can speak on this topic <laughs> much more. Yes, yeah, so, please carry on. So just consolidating what Duncan just now said. Yeah. yeah. Um, when children learn to express, mm -hmm. um, that is where the penny drops, whether they have the confidence to express or 
not? Are we encouraging them to apply their knowledge? Where two factors, two key factors, and both are to be learned very early on. When we teach them communication skills, and I'm talking um, through innovative learning systems, like for example, performing skills. If we take drama, for example, when we are teaching communication skills through drama, we are encouraging them to understand self-expression. Self-awareness becomes a, an integral part of what they're doing in class after class. To technically put it, there are pauses, pitch, pace, uh, articulation, forward placing, all of this. But eventually, the goal is that they should be able to express themselves. And what is so important is that in this process of self-expression, there is no right or wrong. Each one is expressing and each expression is applauded. Each difference is applauded. Each child is encouraged. Each person is motivated. So the creativity, the critical thinking aspect, all of it comes out because each child is full of potential. How that child is motivated to bring all of it to the surface is what is crucial. So when we do it through innovative learning systems like drama, for example, and other arts, we are actually encouraging the uniqueness of the child. Compare this to what otherwise happens in a classroom. We want each child to conform to a set pattern. When that happens, we know that each child, all of us know, all teachers, all educators know that everyone learns at his or her pace. And when they are pushed to conform to a certain uh, structure, someone is falling behind. Then they are shamed, ridiculed, the self-esteem goes for a toss, and self-expression never happens. That means all that potential is lost. So how important the arts are, there is no, um, there are no words, there, there is no debate in it. Uh, all that we need to understand is how to implement, how to integrate these subjects into our day-to-day -day teaching that we do with our children. And I will now um, shift the ball into Karen's quote and ask her as to how does, what does she believe? And I, as I said, there is no debate, only uh, how can we do it? It is so needed. How do we do how do we um, uh, make music an integral part, an integral tool of learning, communication, and uh, cooperation? In the pre-primary and primary segment, the earlier, the better. So on, on to you, Karen. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Arpita. Uh, uh, wonderfully explained. And uh, yes, Karen. Uh, if you can really, as she said, the music, the soul, let's get back to that. Uh, Karen, you need to unmute. Karen, sorry to interrupt. You need to unmute, Karen. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Am I, yeah. Good can to you go, hear me Karen. now? Yeah. Yeah, ah, yeah. Yes. Good to go. Lovely. Um, so I would say that children really learn to be strong and independent humans from a base of loving and secure relationships with a key adult. That can be their parents at home by singing at home 
or with their preschool teacher. And singing in circle time, it just provides exactly that environment which supports and extends children's development and their learning. Um, the great educator Kodai, if I could quote him, he said that the years between three and seven are educationally much more important than the later ones. What is spoiled or omitted at this age cannot be put right later on. In these years, man's future is decided practically for his whole lifetime. So going on from what Arpiter and Duncan were saying, children develop and learn in different ways and at different rates. And with music and with songs, they can all engage at their own pace. Some of them might be just observing, sitting and observing, taking it all in. Others will start singing immediately and joining in, dancing, getting up and um, creating themselves. They're all learning though while doing. It's so important that they actually do things to learn. They don't just sit in rows and receive information. So I wanted to just give a little demo of a very simple song that I might do in my classes. So I'll do that with you all, if you bear with me. So we can all see this. <clears throat> rainbow purple, rainbow blue, rainbow green and yellow too, rainbow orange, rainbow red, rainbow shining overhead. So it's a very small song just introducing colors and but the benefits of that music extend far beyond the acquisition of purely musical skills <laughs> children are learning a musical system concerning of consisting of timbre pitch and rhythm patterns textures and formal structures similar to learning a language Language and memory are in play while learning the song. So that's why repetition, I would say, is really important because children might join in or not. That knowledge will build. So I would advise that the theme isn't changed week by week or even day by day, as some practices do. And there's always a push from adults for what are they learning new? What are they learning new? Repetition is so important because children might learn at their own pace. Children are also learning the basics of reading from this. They're seeing the words while they sing them, but they're not asked to name at this stage. They're reading from left to right, following a pattern which mimics what will happen when they actually start learning to read. I'd introduce this song alongside other songs and activities about colour. For instance, there's another lovely Spanish song called Red is Rojo. So then they're introducing the names of the colours in another language, which is making that connection with other places in the world but it's still the same, but different. This all sharpens the brain's ability to encode a skill used in listening, language and reading. I don't know whether any other members of the panel would like to come in on that and discuss that further. Yes, Karen, I would, thank you. Um... I really enjoy uh, every single uh, class that we have, uh, you know, for the music uh, for little people that uh, you have engineered so beautifully. And I understand what you're talking about, uh, you know, the way that music really helps children to connect so beautifully to learning words, vocabulary, uh, understanding the meaning, so comprehension is taken care of. And I also think that, um, you know, I've been reading your blogs, Karen, 
And I also have been um, sort of learning that uh, when we introduce music at the early ages, uh, you know, below the age of seven, there is a lot of um, interrelation between the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain, which helps children in faster thinking. We've been talking about critical thinking. We've been talking about creative thinking. And uh, this, uh, the music sets a, a, a very good base for both these kind of thinkings. And there's another very beautiful aspect about the music that is it is related very, very closely to mathematics. Uh, that's again, because what you were talking about, the patterns, right? So mathematics is also all about patterns. And music prepares the child to, to look at patterns, to look at rhythms, to move into rhythm, to uh, probably try and imitate rhythms. So when we do all these various exercises uh, with the children, they learn to work with something as abstract as rhythms, which helps them when they get into, the, uh, into trying to learn mathematics, which also is pretty abstract because you do have numbers, you have shapes saying one, shape two, shape three. But then it is a little difficult for our children, especially at the pre-primary, to connect that number one has a value one. That is a little abstract for them. But that helps when, you know, there is music, there are patterns, there is rhythm, and they get the hang of it when they experience all of this as a whole. So I really believe that what you're saying is true. Um, I would like to now ask Akila um, a question. Uh, when we do pre-primary classes, uh, we often find that readiness is a very important part of the classroom. Um, I would like you to now focus a bit on that for us. Yeah, thank you, Archana. Um, and uh, it was wonderful listening to Karen, Arpita, and Duncan uh, talk about uh, the importance of uh, creativity and expression in, in the stimulation at the early childhood age. So children um, need their bodies and brains to take in the stimulation which is being given. They are born with a blueprint, no doubt, an innate uh, blueprint to go through the different stages of development and reach developmental milestones like walking or talking. However, as Karen was rightly saying, the social environment of human connection through touch through soothing voices through love and nurturing are important and as important as that is a stimulating physical environment which is loaded with things to explore and observe with all their senses so in the last 50 years our lifestyles have changed tremendously children are more and more uh, you know in front of a screen and uh, they're getting much less stimulation uh, through humans, significant humans around them, and they're spending less time moving and exploring. And uh, these are leading to uh, a lot of gaps in the developmental uh, milestones. For example, many children don't crawl at all. Uh, and uh, then that could go on and affect their reading and writing because crawling helps the left side and the right side of the brain to connect and um, create those pathways for information to go from this side to the other. And uh, as uh, the others in the panel were pointing out, this is very important that both sides of the brain work together. So when this happens, when this, uh, uh, you know, the sensory motor development goes out of sync, as uh, you can say, we can uh, observe a host of issues with the child. Perhaps the child won't be able to sit or attend or you have a picky eater or difficulty with sleep. Uh, and all these things affect their uh, development. And uh, the current uh, social construct also is such that, uh, you know, both parents generally are working and uh, uh, more children are being sent to daycare or school at a younger and younger age. So it becomes very important that these early learning programs uh, take into account the need for the requisite stimulation that the children need at that age, the sensory motor stimulation they need in order to create those millions of connections and neurons that are possible at this age from zero to six is very crucial for that. And uh, at the Helen O'Grady preschool, uh, through the SMILE, which is the sensory motor integration in the learning environment, SMILE is an acronym for that, 
they have included this as a part of a curriculum with some graded age appropriate activities there is a smile room where the child has obstacle courses can sort of explore a lot of textures there is a lot of space as well as you know there are tires and beams and bolsters and swings and slides even the external environment has a sensory pathway with different textures and uh, there is all these uh, wonderful programs like music for small people the sporty beans program the drama the art which allows them to you know they are all designed to stimulate and strengthen these sensory pathways and help the child to get the right wiring to optimize their learning and overall be very successful and be ready you know to really take it all in whatever is being given to them yeah do you all have anything else to add to that yeah uh, thank you uh, akila for uh, explaining it so well as you said about all this various activities how uh, we can go with the sensory motor skills and uh, uh, before i ask uh, my question uh, to the next speaker i would uh, even like to thank uh, karen for such a lovely demo demonstration karen it was really i mean i went back to my school days my uh, you know <laughs> Uh, the kindergarten levels i could recall all those things that we have lost and uh, we feel so fresh thank you so much karen and now uh, going back to duncan duncan your core area is performing arts and drama so how does drama uh, help developing the 21st century skills especially at early childhood and foundation level if you can uh, share with us Well, um, I just first of all say that um, well, uh, so far I've just learned so much, and Karen, um, you have a most beautiful voice. So I'm also <laughs> going to sing now because I'm in a competition today. So I'm going to sing a little drama song. I want everyone to look and watch me, and let's go. What is the art of good communication? It's time for drama. Hello to you. We all have drama. Oh yes, we do. We'll have a great time today. We love drama. Yay! And um, and this is what our children do when they start our um, our kindy drama, which is for the early learners. And um, I just using as an example because. one of the greatest gifts we can give in communication well greatest gifts we can give to children sorry is communication and enabling children to express how they feel but you know one of the things that people don't realize is that communication is not only with the voice but it's with the body as well so this applies back to the sensory motor skills of course so all the function of creative education is to develop children good motor skills being able to communicate well to think creatively um through a drama pro uh, program so i'm just briefly going to touch on the one aspect which is communication in which i know a lot about um having uh, trained many actors in my time but trained many children all the way down from age 2 all the way up through so so one of the things we need to teach children is how to communicate properly so the communication comes to the use of the voice of course but equally body and in schools nowadays there's not any communication taught through the body so our program that we run is about teaching children how to use their bodies as an expressive tool sure, 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 sure. how to use their voices as an, an as an expressive tool as well and thereby to engage an audience and i always use the example um when i'm explaining to people if you look at people who can communicate well and you know those people i mean i i think of Barack Obama is an example of a good communicator. When you see him um speaking to his audiences, he's 
he's so engaging. He uses his voice well, and he uses his body really well. And we want to have children who are able to do that and move up. So starting at the early years is the foundation for this. So we work with the children on their speech. And one of the things we do with children is to help them with their articulation so that they're able to pronounce their word clearly, whatever language they're speaking in. Um, so this is, this is the key to good communication, to be able to hear what you could say and have the vocabulary to express it. So part of the kindy program that we run for children is to really, really enrich their vocabulary so they can speak really well. And they can, they can then express what they want to say because that's one of the problems that young children have is often they can't express what they really feel. So we need to help children to do that by giving them vocabulary. So we will do exercises with the children to get them to use the articulatory organs, such as the mouth, the lips, um, and the jaw, to open the jaw. We get them to also use the tongue. We do tongue exercises and the back palate, because the back palate, the soft palate at the back also forms the sounds. So we do exercises called lip and tongue. So I'll give you an example here. So we would say to the children, let's say this together. And we do little exercises to warm up the lips, like um, blowing kisses and um, making a wide mouth. And then we say to them, let's try this exercise, really trying to pronounce every letter. Do you like a new baby? And the teacher really forms the words in the mouth. And the children start to learn, through example, how to really, really express themselves. Then we might do jaw exercises, for instance, to really open, um, open the mouth. So we might say something like, how now, brown cow. And the children can learn to open mouth. Because a lot of children have a lazy jaw. And of course, again, that doesn't help with getting the words out. And then, very, very important, is projection. And getting the children to learn how to really get their voice out. So this is one of the keys of the World Economic Forum, teaching children how to communicate clearly. We would then go on to a movement section. And the movement section is about how to express yourself with the body. And we use a very famous technique called the Laban technique. Laban was a, um, or Laban, depending how you pronounce him, um, was a professor of dance. And he broke every single movement we, work, we use in everyday life um, even an inanimate object, um, if you roll it across the floor, how did that move? And he broke all these movements down, and we teach these movements to the children to help them to learn to use their bodies as an expressive tool. So if we, if we starting at an early age, can you imagine, as they go through their school, how confident these children are going to be? One of the things I found all around the world that children have their confidence knocked out of them, and they're afraid to speak up and express themselves. And one of the great things in, in having a drama program, for instance, in the school, or music, as we've just discussed, is that children through that are able to build their confidence and their confidence to be able to express themselves. So this is, this is how we go about it. And then... I just want to move on to one really important side before I stop and let someone else speak because I feel I'm speaking too much. But one very, very important aspect, and that is training children in emotional intelligence. So one of the biggest problems we face, and this is where collaboration and communication skills come, come in. Um, one of the biggest problems we face today is that many children lack in that kind of emotional intelligence of how to deal with issues that come up in their life. And so through our drama, we create a mindfulness kind of work where it's a new buzzword, mindfulness, but in fact, it came from India many years ago. It's, it's what in India we call yoga. And the understanding of the breath and the ancient, the ancient rishis or yogis from India developed these systems of slowing the breath down. And psychologically now, we find in the schools, and this is being taught right around the world, 
that when we slow the breath down and we teach children how to slow the breath down, they're able to deal with situations far better. And actually, as adults, if we learn to also slow our breath down, for instance, if we're doing a public speaking exercise, um, which many, many people fear, the breath is fantastic at helping us to slow, slow down. So what we do with children is we start to um, train them how to slow the, the breath down. And we teach them what we call interpostal diaphragmatic breathing. But that breath is what's called a yoga breath. It came from thousands of years back. Um, we, we all know Patanjali. Patanjali wrote the Yoga Sutras. And in fact, this has come from this ancient tradition, but is now being used worldwide, coined as obviously mindfulness now. Um, to not have a kind of a religious con context, which yoga isn't really about. But um, so we're using these beautiful exercises. So one of the exercises we would do is we would ask a child to put a toy on their belly and we, we're getting them to breathe into the belly. So we're doing diaphragmatic breathing. So And they have to breathe slowly to make, make the uh, toy their, their favorite teddy or... Or, or animal or whatever they love, to move up and down the belly. And what's great about this is we're also teaching children how to become good singers. So when they're in current class, they'll also be able to breathe um, really well for, for their singing. Because little children um, in the early learning situation are have got their lungs are just developing still so we're helping them to also develop the lungs develop the, the diaphragm and these techniques are amazing so we do little exercises you can do it with me so we take we pick up a flower and we sniff the flower nice and deeply and then we breathe out through the mouth and it's also important that we train our children to breathe through the nose and out through the mouth because the nose is there for a, a particular reason. The nose is there to take the air in, warm up the air as it goes through the system. And then when it reaches the lungs, it's nice and warm. So we don't have coughs and asthma and all these things. And then when the air comes out, it comes out the mouth and it goes over the vocal cords and warms it up. It warms it up. And particularly in cold, cold climates, if you're singing, then you need, to, you need to be able to do this breath in and out and build up the lung capacity and be able to speak well. So I have been just giving you a little example of how brilliantly um, through the creative arts and what fun the children can have um, that they can learn these 21st century skills. Very, very important skills. So um, does anyone else want to say anything more on this? Um, I think Arpita might, as uh, she's in the drama field. <laughs> thank yeah, please, you, Arpita. <laughs> we thank would you. like to even thank you, Duncan. It was amazing. So well explained. I wish we had time to watch you more of doing such kind of uh, demonstration. <laughs> well, I, was, I, I had a lot more to do, but it's amazing how the time <laughs> flies when you have yes, 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 <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> Yeah. Thank uh, well, uh, thank you, viewers. Uh, I'm getting questions, and please uh, keep posting questions so that we can get back to you uh, once we are done with this discussion. So it's over to you, Arpita. We are waiting to hear you with some kind of uh, demonstration. Please, if you can also share with us. Thank you. Um, Duncan is quite a magician, and uh, <laughs> he has done so much of work with. Um, with the breathing exercises. And um, all of us experience, have experienced this so many times in our lives. Um, in any stressful situation, we forget to breathe. Um, and whenever uh, we are telling ourselves that we have to calm down, we tell ourselves that take a deep breath. Uh, how wonderful it would be if all of this learning becomes a part of every child's learning um, in the preschool, in the primary years, so that every kid is uh, uh, can do it as part of uh, life and doesn't need to uh, panic and doesn't need to think of it or doesn't need to really attend yoga classes when he or she becomes an adult. 
it is it has to be a part of life right from pre-primary education. Um, since Karen and Duncan both were into singing, let me move a little away from singing. Uh, what happens when, please? Uh, please. when, <laughs> when we also move away, uh, when when we also start to sing um, rhymes which are not written as lyrics? So Karen is such a master at writing lyrics to um, the, for children where they can learn concepts. Uh, she has written immense amount of uh, work and that is wonderful. Uh, we, are, we are hoping that we'll be able to integrate a lot more than what we have done up till now in our preschools. Uh, but I have found another uh, problem uh, with, with our schools and I can say confidently that all of you would agree with me that all of us, when we were doing nursery rhymes, we just learned to sing them. And now when, when I ask teachers, uh, why are you singing this particular rhyme? Um, I get this answer that this way, the student will be able to memorize this uh, nursery rhyme. But then my next question is, why do you think the student needs to memorize, for example, a Baba black ship? Do you think there is anything in it for the child to really memorize? It is written for learning expression. It is The rhyme is there so that the child understands how to express emotions. Uh, Duncan was talking about emotional well-being. That cannot happen unless the child is comfortable displaying emotion. And that has to first happen through the language. Uh, so to give a small demonstration, and uh, it's always uh, such a pleasure to talk to all teachers and ask them as to how can we uh, actually say this rhyme, recite this rhyme, and not sing this rhyme. So suppose the child is saying, ba, ba, black sheep. Have you any wool? Now it is the turn of the sheep to respond. So the child can be taught to imitate the sheep. Yes, uh, yes, uh, three bags full. Now there can be different emotions built in. One for my master. So that is a... a booming voice one for my master one for my team that's a demure voice shy and one for the little boy who lives down the lane so there is expression there and emotion which the child is expressing all nursery rhymes unless they are lyrics should actually be recited they cannot be sung there are songs and there are rhymes. And we should know the difference. And when we actually teach children how to recite, um, they, will, they will learn how to express. They will also learn that there are emotions inbuilt in the words. Then they will start to decipher those emotions in the words. And there is just so much learning that can happen from just four lines twinkle twinkle little star how i wonder what you are up above the world so high like a diamond in the sky so much expression but what do we do we sing it so we should sing the songs where there is where which karen is making and uh, creating with a particular purpose and recite uh, the rhymes which are meant to be taught expression through emotions. Mm, I also have a very favorite uh, story. Uh, 
there is a there is a queen's award winner uh, storyteller who comes to india who loves us um she she even wanted to come here this season but because of corona she cannot be here kusumika chatarji uh she she uh, tells this story i am going to tell this on her behalf just a small part to demonstrate how children can learn parts of speech so in this particular story there is the prepositions that we are teaching children it's called bear hunt so a group of students are on a bear hunt they go out and they are in front of a grassland there is grass dry grass for a long stretch of area so we all say that we we cannot go around it we cannot go over it we cannot go under it so we have to go through it and when we go through it children ex experience a whole lot of things they they listen to the sounds they experience the heat or the cold they also swing with the air to make the sound of the rustling grass they may uh, step on sharp stone so the, all of that experience is then emoted through words and then we come out of the grassland and there is a marshland now we can't go around it we can't go over it we can't go under it so we have to go through it and we then step into the marsh and it's all dirty mucky and there are onomatopoeias splash happening there is so much happening in the marshland and children are experiencing all of it and with each new area that they cross whether it is it is a forest or a pond they experience new things they learn new words and then they reach the cave where the bear is and they see big eyes and they get scared and they run away back to their home so how a story can be beautifully um integrated into learning of uh, prepositions and repetition like karen said is so crucial so that you are taking all children along in the story those who haven't understood it initially will build upon it as we go along and duncan i know when what you mean when you say time flies thank you puloma i pass it on to you now i think right now we don't have puloma here archana why don't you take it over so thank you so much all of you and uh, the more i listen to all of you the more i'm uh, you know so glad that most of these things uh, with your advice has already been included in the preschool curriculum uh, as we get into the discussion uh, i'd like to ask akila again uh you know we have the smile program where we uh, have all our children going through certain activities throughout the day uh throughout the entire year in fact um i just want to know through this program uh, in our preschools so far in the helnogredi preschools we have been able to identify uh, children who have had developmental delays of different kinds and we have also seen how the smile program helps these uh, children so i wanted you to also explain to us um how does uh, the smile program or the sensory motor activities how does it really work and how can the children benefit from such a program uh actually um before i go on to answering that i was really you know uh, taken up by what uh, duncan and arpita and all have shared and i was reminded of um, uh, robert falgum you know who said all i needed to know i learned in kindergarten i think that was his book and he said imagination is stronger than knowledge myth is uh, more uh, potent than history and dreams are more powerful than facts so 
yeah i think you guys are doing a wonderful uh, job of uh, bringing in imagination bringing in stories and uh, building you know uh, what is required for the child but yes uh, as uh, going back to smile uh, uh, the sensory motor integration is very important for the child to receive all this information that is being uh, given to the child and one of the elements besides the smile room where all the stimulation happens in terms of exploring their uh, senses and their motor capabilities and the outdoor areas another important element of the smile uh, program is the awareness that the classroom teachers and all the resource persons have about the importance of these activities and the importance of uh, these milestones and how they connect back to Uh, the learning outcomes or the skills that we are trying to develop so being aware of these things uh, and be having a systematic way also of uh, measuring and checking these things through the uh, assessments in the child smile program uh, also is a key uh, you know fulcrum on which uh, the the success of the program rests so uh, when we keep track of these motor uh, developments or milestones and the skills that the child needs to have at each particular uh, age then we can also become aware of whatever red flags as you call them things that are not happening according to uh, you know the regular pattern and uh, uh, look at those gaps and uh, try to you know sort of uh, modify or individualize the approach to a particular child who is showing that red flag share it with the parents so like arpita uh, and uh, we was uh, suggesting in the pre uh, panel discussion where we were talking about that you don't need an expert to do that every uh, every teacher should be empowered to be able to uh, you know look uh, look into these aspects understand these aspects and see how it correlates to what they are trying to you know teach or give the child and uh, to quickly be also be able to remediate it in the environment itself so if if you for example if you have a child who is not able to sit and uh, wants to run outdoors so you know so to have that ability to give the child a little more exposure to what he is really seeking because that could be what is coming from his uh, need in the sensory motor area he he is wanting to explore through his body a little more so uh, that kind of thing is what is uh, very special about the smile program um that's very and, uh, i think we have really witnessed uh, that some of our children have uh, really benefited from a program like this uh, what i like about this program in the preschool is that uh, it is compulsory there for all our children and we do not um, discriminate and you know single children out uh, you know yeah. uh, and we work with all children together uh, to ensure that the learning happens collaboratively i think uh, duncan has also been talking about collaboration so much of project work that happens uh, at the levels of yes. the uh, lower kindergarten the upper kindergarten where children come together and work on small projects uh you know where the teacher is just watching or is facilitating when they run into trouble but not otherwise so they kind of uh use their thinking skills uh do their uh, you know activity think of how to overcome certain obstacles or problems that they may come across and so beautifully help one another without our assistance at all so i think uh, you know really we uh through these kind of programs these kind of approaches at the helno grady preschool we really are looking at uh, honing these skills to become part of life uh, so thanks so much for that um i would like to very quickly ask uh, duncan and karen and arpita uh, you know another very important thing about the 21st century skills is that uh, this whole uh, concept of the world uh, world is my village kind of concept you know uh it says that uh, that one of the 21st century skills is cross cultural understanding i just like to uh, ask the two of you or or the three of you to tell to tell us a little more about what you think about it. 
Well, um, if I may start, um, I feel very passionately about this. Um, I think we have to, with our children, um, and our children, as they say, are the future, um, is show them about the diversity that exists in our world. And we've just been talking about learning diversity um, with with uh, Hila, and she explained that so so beautifully. Um, I don't like to label a child having a disability. I think they have a learning, um, it, they're learning differently rather than it being a, a difficulty. Um, and the same with our diversity. Um, and sometimes in our schools, we may have children from all different backgrounds, all different cultural backgrounds. I mean, for, in, for instance, in India, um, you may not have people from other countries, but you have a vast country with, with children from different states. And wouldn't it be lovely within the context of um, an early learning situation that children can start to learn from each other about their, first of all, their different cultures within their country. I mean, I come from a, a very fractured country. South Africa, which, as you all know, um, went through an awful apartheid era. And still, today, the children um, are, are kind of separated from that old apartheid. Um, and, and to bring the children together um, and learn about each other's cultures, so, um, and religions for that matter. So, you know, you might have Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, um, Christian children in one class, and they can learn all about each other. But at a global level as well, it's a, such an amazing way in the pre-primary or early learning situation to learn about cultures from... Uh, uh, around the world and you can do that with food you can you can do that um by saying a different greeting from a different country every day i mean in india you've got so many languages you can also do all the different languages um and we can celebrate um each month maybe a different custom a different uh, ritual or um or some special day that they might have in a country and uh, we can play games that children, particularly in the drama, we can play games that children play in different places around the world. But most importantly, we can also learn folk tales and stories. Storytelling is is a big element that we can actually bring into the into the sector. Um, does anyone else want to say anything more on that? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Duncan. Karen, would you like to add, especially, I think, from the music side, I know that you include a lot of music from all over the world in the Music for Little People uh, program. Yes, that's certainly true. We use um, lots lots of music from all over. And, and in fact, myself coming to India, I have you know gone into schools that where the children don't speak any English at all. And the teachers have said to me, well, you know, sort of, what do you think you can do if they don't understand you? And if you just sit down and start singing to the children, they all join in. They all get, they all get it immediately. Music is just such a wonderful connection between peoples. Um, children are learning about their own culture of course to start with and where they fit in society you know they're just with mummy and daddy to start with with a wider family with the grandparents then they discover that they're part of an even bigger family with a village or a little town where they you know the environment where they're living and then they realize that there's a great big world out there there are strange people coming in from England and singing songs with them. <laughs> and, you know, where is, where is England and what's, what's it all about? But we all connect with each other so beautifully through music. We all communicate naturally through it. And you also think about um, how many leading musicians from all over who have used music as a tool to, for social change, for environmental change, um, when there have been famine in Africa, 
we've had the feed the world and all the you know top pop musicians coming together so yes it's a wonderful means of connecting people yes that is true thank you so much karen um so yeah um so um i have a friend um, a senior professor um, in a canadian university she um, she's an art uh, she's a uh, world history history professor and she tells me that arpita the world is much kinder now than it has ever been before and i shudder because i feel if this is the state uh, state of the world which is kind what must have, must it have been earlier but um we were talking about this and i was telling duncan that the only way forward is towards a kinder world and awareness about each other one another is the way to do it um uh, one thing that i have noticed um when when we are when we are trying to uh do something different uh it is the parents who are resisting the change for example if there is a uh, class which has um when, some when children are, when we are trying are, to uh so there are some children who are not keep uh, keeping the same pace there are parents who are unhappy about having those children in the same class as if this is going to somehow harm the growth of their own children um so this this is a very um this is a situation because these parents have not been exposed to the right policies the right um thought processes uh and hence we find that making them unlearn is very difficult children are not a problem children will assimilate they will learn together they will reach out to one another uh, in our drama classes we connect uh, across the countries um, last year we had a connection with maya in cairo the children were so happy they could uh, there was no barrier of uh, language there is never any barrier of language they can talk in 1000 languages uh so the the problem is with the adults so we are we we need to counsel them as well as uh make more and more opportunities for our children uh available for them to understand one another reach out and do cross cultural uh events as many as possible thank you the cross cultural uh, connect i think uh, will uh, uh, would really bring out uh, compassion like you know as you were saying which is really what is required in the current times um yeah i was really wondering in the current times with covid in the in the picture and children really restricted to their homes uh, how are we going to empower parents to uh, you know um, give what is required as stimulation for the children in their homes are there strategies uh, or tools that can help them in the continuum of learning at home also so with the eminent panel like you guys uh, you like to sort of add in over there that, that's a real concern that's a real concern right um akila uh, very rightly put it is something that we've all had to very quickly on our feet think and uh, implement uh, i must say that uh, parents have been uh, a huge support uh, in the uh, program to the uh at uh, you know by, when you're in the uh, preschool uh, program uh, we need to be very sensitive to what our parents are going through as well because there are Uh, as many different problems as there are uh, you know children so um, each family is going through a different thing there are some families that 
uh, you know, look for uh, something that the child can be occupied with, uh, at least for some time uh, during the day. There is a there is there are other families that uh, feel that no, I don't want to uh, sort of you know uh, get onto the digital mode at all. Uh, there are yet other families that say, look, I don't have the time to sit with the child when you guys are going to come on digitally. Uh, you know, uh, so each parent uh, has his or her own. Uh, sort of uh, problem. And I think one of the biggest things that uh, this, uh, uh, the COVID has taught us is that we really need to be empathetic. We really need to understand where each of them is coming from. We know that there's no single parent who is not interested in the progress of the child, but we know that each of them has his or her own constraints. And that's what we are trying to bridge. So uh, during these times, what the Helen O'Grady Preschool has done is that uh, uh, the online program is on where we work with the children for one hour uh, per day, one and a half hours for the upper KG children. But for the younger ones, it's one hour per day. We do a lot of activities. Uh, parents have been our greatest, uh, uh, you know, support for this. They sit with their children and, and the parent and the child together work on various projects uh, through these uh, digital classes. And that's been a uh, rip-roaring success with both parents and children really enjoying the process. And uh, I think that's been the biggest takeaway for us from this exercise. Uh, however, we've also been sensitive to the fact that there are parents who want to do things but have started going back to work and may not have the time uh, during the morning times when the classes are on. So for them, uh, we have developed the homeschooling kit. I'd just like to show you a uh, little bits of it. Uh, you know, So the homeschooling kit basically uh, comes with a manual for the parent. Uh, the manual has various activities that the parent can do with the child at his or her own pace. So uh, even if the parent does not have uh, time to work with the child in the mornings, this can be done in the evenings. It basically looks at having two hours of time, uh, you know, that the parent has to spend with the child uh, every day. Now, um, the book that you see is, is for a period of one month. So every month has a book like this which the parent would use. Uh, since the uh, Helen O'Grady believes uh, is kind of led by the Reggio Emilia approach, uh, nature has become the biggest teacher and uh, you know uh, the learning atmosphere is what we uh, really uh, want the parent and the child to enjoy. So a lot of activities with whatever is available at home in the gardens is what we've planned. Uh, we've done the field testing of this manual and uh, parents who have field tested have given us really good reports of how much they have enjoyed the entire program. So we're really very happy. And this program comes with a whole lot of things. You know, I must show you if I can fit it into the frame, uh, the box. So this is the box uh, which a parent gets when he or she uh, gets into the homeschooling program. It has a whole lot of things, whatever uh, books, uh, picture books, coloring books. Uh, that the child requires. It has, uh, you know, the art material that we may need. It has the various puppets that the child will use or the parent will use for their storytelling program. Um, it has a slate and chalk and duster uh, for their activities. Um, it has crayons and clay uh, and things like that, which again, uh, you know, we, we use a lot of that for the uh, for preschool education. So all that is given uh, to the parent. And I think the highlight of this is every parent is assigned a mentor. And the mentor will meet with the parent every week online, digitally, uh, to guide the parent. Because we know that many parents may not have really been, may not have been on the agenda when they started this year. But uh, probably because of COVID, they would like to keep the child at home and not really expose the child perhaps to anything else and therefore would like to continue homeschooling. So uh, there is a mentor who will guide the parent every week. And the child who is part of the homeschooling program has the option of uh, linking into our drama classes uh, and our yoga classes and the music and movement program. So uh, these are things through which we hope that we can still maintain that balance of uh, self-learning or learning with the parent, as well as some uh, little spaces where children will get to interact with other children during the drama program or the music and movement program. So this is uh, something that uh, we've started doing now. Uh, we also want parents to come forward and uh, uh, 
you know, uh, talk to us about the homeschooling kit if they are interested. I'll, I'll just like to add uh, something here. Yes. Uh, that uh, there is a lot of talk about um, screen time. Uh, how much screen time children are being exposed to. Uh, constructive learning screen time is is welcome, I believe. And um, we also have to understand uh, or accept one thing about this new generation, that they are wired differently. Um, they have taken to the online learning like fish to water. Um, in fact, the entire teacher teaching fraternity have to be commended for the way in which they have pulled themselves up, learned the tricks of the trade, and got uh, into the online teaching arena so that our children can continue to learn from home. Uh, children have been um, uh, getting the benefit of it. Uh, I know that uh, we have conducted um, now hundreds of uh, drama workshops and uh, kept children creatively engaged. They've been happy. They have been. Um, uh, they have come up with fantastic imaginative output. Uh, so the the balance is needed. Guidance that we provide to parents is also very important uh, with regards to what all activities they can do with children offline. But some concession for online should be made. Uh, too much paranoia, I believe, has been created, which may not be justified. That's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Arpita. And uh, can I request anyone else from the panel to uh, share your views as a takeaway or a message for the viewers? So you can please uh, contribute your views uh, before I wrap up the session. Uh, I well, think I'd start off. Um, just to say that, um, uh, you know, I think it's very important, uh, especially today is the day that, uh, uh, you know, India has announced its new educational policy 2020. Uh, we have been moving towards trying to integrate a lot of uh, activity based learning, a lot of creative thinking based learning, a lot of um, uh, creativity based learning. Um, into preschooling for a very long time now. Um, I think preschools have been crying themselves hoarse that they don't want to become uh, just preparatory ground for grade one. Uh, you know, children at this age ha have to be respected for the kind of, uh, you know, the play that is needed at this stage. And the, through the new educational policy that we have today, I think the government of India has recognized that very, very truly, it's not just the preschool segment, but right up to grade two, that we need to use alternative methods of education, because this is the place where foundation is being laid. And very rightly, these are called, this is called the foundation age. So I think that's something that's very heartening. So we look forward, you know, to these children who finish the upper KG. Uh, right now, they struggle when they get into grade one because suddenly there is a jump from, uh, you know, the kind of learning that we have, which is more activity based, uh, more project based, more play based to sudden examinations and tests at grade one. So I think now with this new policy, I'm, I'm just so uh, hopeful that up to grade two, we will continue with play based uh, mechanisms uh, to learn. Uh, whether it is mathematics, whether it is science. Excuse me, Arpita, you unmute, unmute. Your mic microphone is mute, Arpita. 
Arpita, unmute yourself. It got mute. Yes. No, but I'm. Can you uh, hear me, Arpita? Yes, Puloma. I was not saying anything, uh, but thank you. Uh, I I agree with Arjuna. The new policy is looking very positive. Uh, it uh, these are the steps in the right direction. Um, I I think the government uh, taking the lead and the private enterprise, uh, which has been uh, becoming very vocal about um, integrating the right thing into the curriculum. Uh, we are headed towards a very uh, positive uh, time, uh, and and uh, children are going to be the beneficiaries as they should be. Thank you, uh, thank you so much. Uh, it was a fantastic discussion with brilliant speakers, uh, contributing yourself in your areas. So well explained, impactful. So many things we have add on, so, so many information, inputs, valuable inputs, and a great insight to this uh, session. And uh, as rightly said, uh, I would like to request my viewers, especially the one who is dealing with this uh, group of students from the early childhood, I mean, the foundation to early childhood, it is really, really very, very important for you all to understand this 21st century uh, skills. Uh, as um, Archana just said, that uh, when the students, they are in the kindergarten and when they are uh, promoted to grade one, it's a transition phase. Am I right, uh, Archana? And that is the phase when they struggle, which is everywhere. Uh, mostly, I have seen teachers who are dealing grade one students complaining about this because um, there's something which is uh, not connecting. Uh, the strategies, the policies, the practices, it's not connecting the way it should connect. And uh, uh, as rightly said, that it should not only in the kindergarten, but it should also go beyond kindergarten to grade two, which is the early childhood uh, and education stage. So yes, we have to take care of it. And uh, fantastic um, session with uh, beautiful demos. Uh, contributed by you all in this stipulated time. You have really touched all the faces, all the structures of the 21st century skills. It is really brilliant and commandable job from all of you. Thank you, speakers. And uh, now moving on to the question answer session. I'm glad I'll just... Uh, uh, can you see this question coming up on the screen? It's crawling. OK, this is from Naresh Rai. He says, thanks for the good discussion. Can we teach the needed skills through games such as musical chair, etc.? So it's open to you, my dear speakers. Any one of you can answer this question of Naresh Rai. Um, Naresh, thank you for the question. Um, yes, we can, and I know in the music side, um, Karen will say something, but um, I, in, in drama, it is the most fantastic opportunity to teach these skills through games, so various games um, of collaboration. Um, I, I wouldn't say musical chairs one, but there are many other circle games that you can play in drama which teaches children how to collaborate with each, with each other, teaches children how to communicate with, with each other, teaches even children how to think critically. So yes, these games are very important. Games um, for children and learning go hand in hand. If the children are not playing games in school, it's a sad school. Thank you so much, Duncan. Yeah, <laughs> uh, anyone else? jump in as I've, I've got, the, um, got the question now. Yeah, yeah, please. Um, yeah, please go. Reiterating what Duncan said, I would say that there are a lot better games than musical chairs. And um, one little um, tweak that I would do to musical chairs when I teach it um, that makes it much better for collaboration is don't take the chair away um, so that you're excluding children throughout the game of musical chairs. Instead, um, do it with cushions on the floor so they have to get onto a cushion or a little spot on the floor 
And instead of a child being excluded when they're out, they have to sit on another child. Uh -huh. So each time it stops, each time the music stops, they have to sit on somebody else. So at the end of the game, you have the entire class sitting on top of each other in a great big pile of children. And they absolutely love that. So. Oh, that's a lovely take on musical chairs. Instead of uh, eliminating the child, you just eliminate a pillow. That's so beautiful. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think one of the things that you can learn through a musical chair is listening skills because you can yes. the child has to listen yes. to you. And when yes. the music stops, yeah. the child has to find a chair to sit down or a pillow. So listening skills can definitely be honed if you're very keen to use only musical chairs as an example. Yes. I truly love Karen's idea. Uh, how children would love to be on top of each other. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and and uh, children these days are not getting this experience. Earlier, I remember when we used to go to our uh, grandparents' house, all the cousins used to be on top of each other. You know, that used to be uh, the favorite game. <laughs> but but uh, fantastic, Karen. Thank you. So there, so, so there is a game um, with words, so communication skills, and also get to know children uh, that whole collaboration aspect on cultural learning, um, where it is done in the musical chair situation, where they have to find one child in the middle, and there's one... So the, all the other children sit around on chairs. So there's not a chair available. So the, the child in the middle will say, you might decide that you're going to do something that everyone likes. So the child might say, I, I like um, um, Sandesh. And if all the other kids in the room like Sandesh, then they have to get up on the chair and move to another chair. And that chair, child in the middle has to find quickly a chair. And then there's a child left in the middle. And then they get the child calling. So no one's left out. They always have a chance to play. Um, and that's a beautiful collaboration game, particularly about understanding each other and realizing that we all have different likes and dislikes. That we're not all the same. We're not all the same, but um, but we share you know, you know. a oneness. Uniquely different, yes. And we can see that Duncan is missing Bengal. I am. <laughs> <laughs> that was my favorite. <laughs> Thank so, you. Akira, do you think yeah. like musical would be useful for children with um, uh, maybe any kind of a developmental delay? Will that help in any way? Absolutely. I mean, uh, it doesn't matter whether if you have a developmental delay or not. I think it's going to be a wonderful uh, game. But especially if you have difficulties. It's a, I mean, even if you have difficulties with being in a group and learning to follow instructions, for example, um, or, you know, uh, as you said, listening, these, these are the areas that it's going to help with. So, yes, uh, it, it's a fantastic. We do play these games with, uh, you know, our children who have even severe difficulties, and they really lot of patients to of Coco uh, with the chairs. So they need to come and, you know, say something and push the guy out of the chair and run around again. And, yeah. And children so learning so to play, kind. I think, is the best thing. Yeah. Children are learning so to kind. play is the, the best. Thing, sorry. The thing that happens is yeah. that for instance, with differently abled children, then you, if you've got them all mixed together in a class, the very able children will t say to the other ones, come here, come here, come and sit on me, come and sit on me. And they're all looking after each other, you know, again. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, everyone shared your views and it was really fantastic and something which has some traditional way with a touch of you know some creative thing that uh, fulfill the purpose using so many senses together that's really great uh, coming to uh, another question asked by Sheila Kimka and uh, Shoba 
Ginodia. It's uh, coming on the screen. Uh, Sheila uh, asks, can we enroll from India? Uh, I think this was the question asked when Duncan was uh, giving that demo on trauma, Duncan. So that was the time when this question was asked that can we enroll from India and do you have an online course? Uh, that's a question asked by Sheila and a similar kind of question asked by Shoba that I do would like to know more of this art for the free primary. So thank you. Uh, viewers are get, getting inspired and asking such questions. So who can add uh, something questions. on this? And most definitely we do. And uh, um, Archana will and Arpita will, will be able to help you in India. Um, so mm -hmm. maybe you can you can chat about that. Yeah, we'll connect. Yes, certainly. So uh, we okay. have all uh, all these programs for preschoolers, and uh, we can help you with uh, whichever you would like to uh, enroll for. Yeah, our classes are right now on. In fact, uh, the batches are open, so we'll get in touch with you, and you can enroll. Uh, that's fantastic. Can can we share them some link, uh, speakers? Is is there any uh, link? Through I'm which so they can uh, get in touch with you. Uh, yeah. I mean, can you help them by uh, sharing some link or yes, some sites? Yes, they are all. Thank you. Thank you. So I will send them the sites. Sure, that 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 sounds perfect. Okay, and I don't think uh, much questions, but uh, uh, there are some thank you notes that have come up from the viewers. And uh, they all say that it was really very informative and they would like to inculcate that in their teaching learning practice as well. So thank you all of you for joining us in this wonderful, brilliant panel discussion. And I'm sure uh, the takeaways are valuable and you are just going to implement that and bring transformation from what it was before. A transformation to a new direction and a great dimension. Thank you, all of you. All of you, stay well, stay healthy, and take care. See you again. Keep thank in touch. you, Purama. Thank you, Getty. And thanks, thank everybody. You. Karen, by Akila. Thank Duncan, you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for watching us, everyone. It's and thank you. And thank you, audience. Once again, once again, I thank and all my panel speakers. Time to go. And uh, especially Sing Karen and high. Duncan, because Sing of the different low. time zone you have matched up, matched up with. Yeah. We can see the standard the time. time. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you, both of you. A special thank for Karen and Duncan to match up with this Indian standard time. And all of you are really great uh, having you all with us here in this session of Hashtag Disruptive Education. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Take care.